Amen. Amen. <clears throat> what a wonderful day. Amen. What a wonderful season. What a wonderful, uh, amazing time that we see ourselves in right now. May it be God's will that he should send Messiah Yeshua today. Amen. And bring about the uh, resurrection. Bring about the redemption. You know, there's a dispute. There was, there was a dispute in the Talmud as to when uh, the, the, the resurrection or the redemption, rather, was going to happen. Some say it was going to happen in Nisan, which is now, during Pesach. And some said, no, it's going to happen in Tishrei. And the answer is that they're both right. And that the first part of the redemption happened now. And the final redemption will happen in the days of Tishrei when the king shall rule. Amen? Amen. Let's open up, open up with prayer and get right to our topic today. Adonai, we thank you, Hashem, for your word. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us your holy Torah, who has commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Lord God, may it be your will, Hashem, that today we are clothed with the living Torah. Help us, Hashem, as we explore your word to bring out nuggets of truth that will carry us through until we see the shining face of the Mashiach may be soon in our time. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Well, it has been a uh, wonderful season and a, an exhausting season. Uh, it's a lot of uh, effort. It's a lot of, of wonderful effort. It's a, a, a labor of love, as they say, but, but it's uh, a lot of work nonetheless. And so... Uh, my wife and, and I and others have, uh, you know, retired. So today's message is God is good. All right. All right. So that's it. Baruch Hashem, the just shall live by faith. Uh, he's full of grace and mercy. Okay, I've, I've, I've covered all the themes, man. I'm, I'm out. I'm, I'm out. I'm spent. My wife asked me, she said, what's your, what's your Josh going to be about today? I said, God. So... I mean, that's pretty much where, we, where we're at right now. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> no, it's awesome, isn't it? It's so good to see everyone. I do have uh, just a few things. I, I, I was thinking, I was actually sincerely davening and saying, you know, Hashem, what, there's so much that could be said. What, what do you want me to say about this uh, wonderful time? We've, we've talked about uh, the, the various uh, tour portions and what have you, and and so, as I was just davening and praying and asking Hashem to help me to know exactly what He would say, that uh, I came back to something that motivated me from the very beginning. Um, and that is the theme of now what? Now what? So, um, before I get into that story, I just want to share something because we were talking about being tired and so on. And so I'd like to, if it's God, with God's help from time to time, impart little nuggets of truth to help us in our lives, and particularly uh, leadership truths. So <clears throat> one of the things I think that uh, just really, and this, this crosses over into topics of leadership, it also crosses over into topics of faith and just life in general. And that is the, the age-old cliche or adage that you've heard before is that, that uh, losers, uh, you know, they, 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 they quit, right? Leaders never quit, right? And quitters never win. That's the, that's the adage, right? And so this, this, if you think about that topic, that, that statement, it applies to us in our life. As a leader, uh, when I get to the, to the point of exhaustion, where I'm just, uh, you know, uh, been joking with Mikael that, you know, we, I, we live here, um, you know, but this, which is good. I, I mean, you know, better to, uh, one day in the house of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere, right? right, right. I'd rather live here than somewhere else. And so, <clears throat> but the point being is that when you get to the point of where you think you can't go on any further, that's when you go on. The apostle Shaul, when he was writing to his congregation, said, when, when you've done all you can do to stand, stand. Rocky wanted to go the distance, right? That was, his, that was his goal when he was fighting Apollo Creed. He just wanted to go the distance. You know, it reminds me of a story of a, the, the CEO of a, of a big company and had, a, had a, just going through a difficult time, the difficult transitions. And 
he walked in and he told his, his administration executive, he said, uh, well, I, I'm, it's been horrible. It's a horrible day today. Uh, this has just really gotten to me. I'm not sure I can take this anymore. And so I quit. <laughs> and the administrator said, very good, sir. So I'll see you in the morning. And he said, okay, I'll see you in the morning. Thomas Edison, they say, had 10,000 failures before he created the light bulb. And someone at once asked him, hey, didn't you get discouraged? You had 10,000 failures? He finally got it, but I mean, 10,000, come on. And he said, no, and I just found 10,000 ways how not to create a light bulb. All right, so we have this idea. I just want to tell us that, that we're, here we live in a, in a world. We live in the, in, the, in the diaspora. We live in the exile. We live in a dark place. Uh, <clears throat> we are... If you're a part of Sar Shalom slash Lapid, if you're a part of this movement, you are, you are uh, involved in, in a pioneering work. You know, today, if you go on, on the web, you will find Chabad everywhere, right? I mean, they're everywhere. And, I mean, and, it's, and they've got an excellent website, and it's... It's a great resource, and one day I pray that, you know, God willing, that we'll be able to develop such resources where people can go to the mylapid.com and find these kinds of, of answers and so on. Not that they're necessarily different, but they're just, they're just a resource, right? But, um, but this Chabad did not happen overnight. Chabad has been around for a very, very long time. And the Chabad we know today was at one point just a block in Brooklyn. That was in the, in the 40s. And through the tenacious vision of their various rebbies, they continue moving forward and continue pressing forward. To whereas today, there is Chabad is like a luxury, right? You go there, they have the best mikvahs, they have the best shuls, everything's wonderful. But I wonder if you could sit down with some of those gray-haired rebbies and rabbis, and they could tell you in the days when they showed up to uh, some place and there wasn't anything. There was absolutely nothing. Uh, you know, we, uh, we, we're talking about, uh, you know, making a mikvah here and, and doing those. It's, it's a lot of work and the, the, the permitting and all these kind of things we've got to deal with. And so looking back, we've got to have a mikvah. And it's important. We've got to have it. And, and, and these things just take time to develop. But the point is perseverance. We have to persevere. And we have to persevere in our faith, too, because here we are in the Gilda, and we show up, and we see idolatry all around us, right? We see it everywhere. It's on, on fine display everywhere. And yet we're wondering, Mashiach, when are you going to come? I don't know if I can continue on. And I'm, so therefore, I'm going to continue on. All right? How many planes did the Wright brothers crash before they found one that would fly? And so perseverance, I just want to give that to you. But many years ago, when... Many, about 100 years ago uh, in another life, uh, when I became religious, I uh, started out in the church world initially, and uh, I did what most Christians do. I, Hashem impressed upon me, and I, uh, you know, I responded to that and, be, and declared faith in Mashiach. And some people do that, and it's just... Uh, it doesn't go anywhere, and there's others who do that, and it takes them uh, far places. I've always been of the opinion that someone whose heart truly is on fire for Hashem, somebody who really, really loves God, who really, really is seeking Him with all their heart, I think that eventually they will end up in a place like this. I believe that with my entire being, that eventually, it may take longer than others, but eventually somebody will discover that there is more to life than cotton candy. No, listen to me. No, I'm not, I'm not being funny. There's more to life. You know, you, you eat cotton candy, smells good, it looks good, it's colorful, it's attractive. I mean, I hate cotton candy. I hate it with a passion. I don't, I'm not against it. If you like it, it's fine, okay? But I, I, I hate it. But I will admit, when I walk by a cotton candy machine at the fair, I'm tempted because it smells good. But I know that when I put that fuzz in my mouth, one, it's going to be gone in a half a second. And two, I'll be mad because I was hungry and now I'm even more hungry because the temptation of, of food made my stomach want more. And then I put the cotton candy in my mouth and now I have nothing. 
And then I'm going to be left with a horrible aftertaste in my mouth of sugary sweet nothingness. And after doing that a few times, eventually, you, one will say to themselves, there's got to be more to the, to the banquet than the cotton candy. Yes. And then they discover the steak, the potatoes, the lamb, the chicken. Uh, well, that's all we have for today. <laughs> so, what happened to me is that I was, I was quickly handed that, that very day, I was handed a little booklet. And it was a cotton candy book, really, but it was a little booklet. But the title of the booklet rings in my mind even today. What was beyond the cover was not very much, but what was on the cover said everything. The title of the little booklet was, Now What?, Inside the book was find a church, get around other people that believe like you, and read the book of John. I mean, literally. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be degrading or whatever. I'm just simply saying that that's, that was a whole lot of nothing. Find a church, get around people, and read, read the book of John, which is like reading in the middle of a novel. You know, it's like in school. We're going to start with U.S. history. Beginning in, I don't know, Vietnam War. Here we go. That's how we're going to start our U.S. history class, Vietnam War. We'll talk about, we'll mention, you know, the founding of the nation at some point. And that's what happens in history classes today. It's why children believe that we fought the Germans to win our independence from England. So, <laughs> right. <clears throat> so, so anyway... But, but almost immediately, Hashem used the title of that little book. See, he can, he can use anything and does use anything to reach us. And he used the title of that little book to get me stirred up and fired up in my soul to say, yeah, what it, now, now what? I'm, uh, I'm redeemed, I'm saved, I'm out of Egypt. And so I'm, I'm bringing this home to us now. Now what? Now when we leave Mitzrayim and we are... God, our, our things, and we're so excited, and yes, we're free, and so the issue now is free to do what? Now what? What do we do now? And unfortunately, my wife and I, or maybe not unfortunately, maybe, maybe not unfortunately, maybe for the best, my wife and I pursued that question of now what? In our own way, we asked ourselves and we asked others for many years, now what, now what, now what? What's the roadmap? What's the path? What's the direction? And nobody could give us anything. It was always just real vague, as if you were asking somebody, how do I get to San Antonio? And they would say, well, you know, you kind of travel southwardly and you, you know, kind of go more or less in a line, but there will be turns, and there's a moment at which you will arrive in a city, and there's going to be like another big road that intersects that road, and you'll want to go towards that area. <laughs> That's the level of the answer for now what instead of just saying it's Interstate 35 until you hit the Alamo and you stop. I mean, you just go right there, right? All the way, right? The Alamo is like the temple. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. I'm kidding. It's not. Don't dive in there. So, the reason that we are here today, the reason that I'm here today, and thank God you're here with me. Yes. Is because of this question of now what? Because I was not satisfied with just simply wandering around in a wilderness, believing in God, and that's it. I wasn't, and, and, and knowing me, listen, you know, people say, well, I, want, I just want to be led by the Spirit. I want to hear the Spirit. Well, as I mentioned last night, first of all, according to Jewish literature, and listen, we talk about Jewish literature, we have to pay attention because... Jewish literature is Jewish thought. 
And so when the writers of the Bible are writing, they're writing from a Jewish perspective, a Jewish thought. They're not writing from a Gentile perspective. They're not writing from a Christian perspective. They're writing from a Jewish perspective. So when they talk about the spirit, they, in their minds, you, all you have to do is go back to the Talmud, to the Midrash, and to a, a dozen other sources, and you find that the spirit is equal to the law of God. They're, in other words, the Torah, to the word of God. So when they said, be led by the spirit, now I can follow God according to the spirit of truth. The spirit is the law of God. There's, there's not the spirit, the law, and then, and then the law is opposed to it, God forbid. I mean, think about that. God, who's a spirit, wrote his word, but yet his spirit is contrary to what he wrote down. And the, I mean, that doesn't even make any sense. Uh, so anyway, so being led by the spirit, but I, I, I don't want to be annoying my own self. God forbid I should be led by my own interpretations. That's dangerous. In fact, to that, I want to read a story to you. Let me see if I can find it real quickly. I didn't mark it because I didn't think I was actually going to read it. But now that I said that, I'm going to read it. So, um, 65. Talk so much yourselves for a second. Here we go. Here it is. Oh, yes. Take the other road. From, this is a story related to Parashah Bo. It was on Yom Kippur Eve, the night of Kol Nidre. As usual, the Yishmach Moshe addressed his congregation, exhorting them to abandon their false and wicked practices and repent wholeheartedly. In conclusion, he said, you may ask why I don't repent as well. Why I am not the perfect example. To this question, I will reply with a short story. A man once lost his way in a forest. When he met up with another man, he rushed up to him and eagerly asked, how does one get out of this place? To which the other replied, I'm afraid that I cannot tell you that. I am also lost and do not know the way out myself. But one thing I can tell you, don't take the path I just took. <laughs> you know, this reminds me of something that we talk about Messiah Yeshua being divine, being born of a virgin and yes he was and so I, I ta I've taught on that at length <clears throat> and the question is well because it messes with people particularly if they're trying to reconcile Jewish thought which does reconcile but sometimes they don't think it does because they get their you know they google it and so it doesn't work that way <clears throat> and so they wonder why Yeshua had to be born of it like that and be divine and born of a virgin. Why couldn't he be born of it? Why couldn't the Messiah just be a man? Like a lot of Jews think, although that's a more modern thought. In ancient times, they didn't really think that. But why? And the answer to this is, well, I'm asking you a question. Could the captain of the Titanic save the passengers on his ship? And the answer, of course, is no. The question is, why not? The answer is because he's on the ship. He's in the forest. He's lost too. The fact of the matter is that man, mankind, is, has the poison in our veins of the serpent in the, in the garden. The sages say there are four men who would not have died, they were completely sinless. Yes, it is absolutely possible to live a sinless life. Yes, it is. Absolutely is. Some people have been taught otherwise, but if you think about that, if, it, if, if one says it's not possible to live a sinless life, then one is saying that God gave us a law that sets us up for failure. When we give our children rules we don't expect them to be perfect. We anticipate that they're going to violate a rule, but the rules that we give them are attainable. They may break them, and then there's punishment and reward and grace and mercy and all that kind of stuff, but the fact of the matter is they could have done it. And when we say to God, God, your law is such that we can't help but sin, then we're saying you're unjust in your law. You're not a just lawgiver, God forbid. Hospice Shalom. 
But the fact of the matter is, is that we all have been given a law by God that we can attain. Is it true that we've all sinned and fallen short, you could say, of the glory of God? Sure it is. That is true. But that's not because we couldn't do it. It's because we chose not to do it. But going back to the point that the sages say there are four men who died only because of the sin of Adam. Why? Because the sage is going to explain after the sin of Adam, every time man and woman came together to procreate, there was an element built in there of self-gratification. And that element of self-gratification poisons the offspring, as it were. And therefore, it brings down the serpent's venom into the child. This is what the sages say. So I ask you a logical question. How do you break that cycle? You have to be born outside of that cycle. You have to be on another ship in order to save the Titanic. You have to be outside the forest in order to tell people who are lost in the forest to hear your voice and where to come to. Because my sheep know my voice. But if I'm, if I'm in the pen with them, I'm also locked in with them. So going back to this topic of now what, I want to turn to um, the book of, um, well, actually, before we do that, I want to, I want to turn to something somewhat seemingly random, but Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, it says, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from Hashem's ham, hand double for all her sins. Say double. double. Double for all her sins. There's an ethic in Judaism. There's a belief in Judaism amongst the sages that when we make teshuva, God somehow supernaturally transforms our sins into merit. I want you to think about that for a second. It's not just that Hashem forgives our sins, but he actually takes our transgressions and our sins and our iniquities and transforms them from a negative into a positive. Verse 3 is what I want to focus on. It says, a voice of one calling in the desert prepare the way of Hashem, make straight paths in the wilderness, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, and rough ground shall become level, and a rugged place plain, and the glory of Hashem will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, from the mouth of Adonai has spoken. Now, to this, the art scroll commentary on Isaiah, to this verse, says this statement. A voice calls out in the wilderness, a barbanel said, this is not, say not. not. This is not a new voice with a new covenant. Wow. 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 Let me just read that again. This is a barbanel. Barbanel was a big time scholar in the Middle Age area, uh, era. He said, this is not a new voice with a new covenant. Rather, it is the same voice that called out from the wilderness of Sinai with instructions to keep all, say all, all, all of the commandments. Only by doing so will the nations be able to clear the way of Hashem. Did you catch that? That only by us following the mitzvahs will the nations be able to clear a way to Hashem. In other words, the nations are lost in the forest. We have heard the voice of the master who stands outside the forest because he's outside the realm of the serpent, beckoning us to call. And only when we follow the path to the way will the other nations know how to get out of the forest too. See, they're, they're coming up to us and saying, we, we're lost. And we say, we're lost too. We don't know what to do. But now we can say, actually, we're not lost. We know the way out, and the way out is faith in the Mashiach and obedience to the law of God. This is the now what? 
When we're set free from the law of sin and death in order to follow the law of life, which is the law of God, the law of Moses, we suddenly have in our grasp a, a, a path to follow, which is the now what path. So relevant to this day of the Exodus, we're free, we're free indeed, who the, who the sun sets free is free indeed, all those things are true, and now what? And this is why Messiah says when he's getting ready to be crucified, when he's getting ready to leave his Talmudim, after having spent with them now his third Seder, he imparts to them special topics. When one of which is, if you love me, keep my Torah. In other words, he is giving us the plan for success. He's giving us the noun what? You believe in me? You followed me your entire life? Now... If you love me, follow my Torah. By the way, something that my wife and I were talking about yesterday, I think, uh, <laughs> days have become like echad. <laughs> so, um, but I was talking about the, the, the foot washing that Messiah did for his Talmudim and how unique and how special that was and how they were shocked at what he was doing. And at the Seder last night, I talked about how the Talmud is supposed to bring the water bowl up to the leader and wash his hands. And so Mashiach, being the king of kings, reversed the order for his Talmudim. And that was shocking and amazing. And we, we've talked about that. And many believers have talked about that and, and so on and so on. But I just kind of sat for a second and thought, wait a minute. This is not the first Seder he's ever had with them but it's the first time he ever washed their feet. Perhaps in previous satyrs, they brought him the water bowl and they washed his hands. In your blood live, in your blood live. What you've done for me, I, do, I return to you, now return to me. You see, God is cyclical, it's cyclical rather. God, God does things that he... He, he puts us in a desire to praise him and then we praise him and then he blesses us and puts a desire to praise him and we praise him and he blesses us and puts a desire. To... It's not linear. And gr the Greek mind thinks in linear, but that's not the Hebrew mind. The Hebrew mind is a circle, which is why we have the circle of festivals. So in Joshua chapter one, it's not a new covenant. And that was the, that was the first illumination for me is that it's not a new way. It's a renewed way. It's not a new way. It's a renewed way. And this is the now what? This is what's going to keep it. We're about to read a promise from God himself. This is how you can guarantee success for your life. And God willing, I'm going to come back and talk about tenacity in just a second. Because this, the, many of us, uh, because we're humans, you know, we want a new word from God from sometimes. And God doesn't want us to have a new word. He wants us to have the original word because the original word was a successful word. We get bored with it sometimes, right? We're living successful lives, and we say, ah, oh, I need a new word for God. He said, why? What are you missing? <laughs> this is the dog that wants to leave. This is the cow that wants the grass on the other side of the fence. For what? On the other side of the fence is wolves. So anyway, Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of Hashem, this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, by the way. After the death of Moses, the servant of Hashem, Adonai said to Yehoshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moshe, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the deserts of Lebanon and from the great river of the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. By the way, Joshua's name in Hebrew is Yeshua. So we have a picture here, we have a spiritual, spiritual picture that in Yeshua, the covenant is the same as it was in Moshe. 
It's the same covenant. When you come into the promised land, in other words, when you have realized the redemption that I sought for you, when you have realized the goal of the Exodus, which was to enter into my rest, which is to enter into my promised land, what is God's instruction? What is his now what once we have realized the prize of redemption? The now what is follow my law. A lot of times we, we understand or we think or we've been taught that once we accept salvation and therefore enter into the proverbial promised land of God, that we jettison the law. We jettison Moses. We want Yeshua. We want Joshua. That is, if, we, if the Messiah was going to be in the English Bibles, if you were going to use the Messiah's name in English, it would be Joshua. We want Joshua, not Moses. But here's the thing. God says with I'm with Yeshua, just like I was with Moses. There isn't a difference. It's the same Torah. Verse 6, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. This is going back to, to tenacity. Be strong and be create courageous. When you feel like you can't move another inch, move another inch. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to our forefathers to give them. By the way, unfortunately, we have known people through the years, thankfully not, not a whole lot, but sadly too many, because one is too many, but we've known people who have given up. They've come into this movement from the church or from some other place, and they, they, they get a hold of the truth, but then something happens. Uh, you know, sister loudmouth offends them or, you know, the, the rabbi wore the wrong tie or they got on Rabbi Google and they read something and they couldn't reconcile it or, you know, whatever, a whole host of things happen. They get messed up and then they leave and uh, they, they, they go out. You know what happens to those people today? Oh, they're, leaving, they're, they're leading uh, successful religious lives in the synagogue or successful religious lives in a church. No, they're not. They're sitting at home doing nothing worse off than they were when they began. And you say, well, what's the, what's, why has that happened, Rabbi? Is, is something wrong with, with Judaism? Is something wrong with Lapid? Is something wrong with Sar Shalom? No, I'm, we're all here. All of you who have trusted in God are alive today. What, I mean, some people have been here for years and years and years, and we, we've lost our mind. <laughs> so what's the difference? The answer is, we, they weren't strong and courageous. Wow. You know, there's a midrash about this. There's a midrash about this, that, that the nations will come and they'll get excited and, boy, that put on the tallit and the tzitzit and that rat, that tefillin, uh, hard, uh, uh, you know, and they'll get real excited about it, walk around with a big old tefillin on their head all the time, and they're converted, they're Jews, they believe, and, believe, and then, the, this is not, I'm not making this up, it's kind of the Texas version, but it says that when the nations, or the, uh, the nations will gather against Jerusalem to make war, those fake converts will rip off their tefillin and rip off their seat seat and abandon Judaism in a flash. And it says the Holy One must be he will laugh at them and mock them. And unfortunately, this happens too often. Now, it's not because the nations of the world uh, gather against Jerusalem, or is it? You know, I, 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 let me tell you why I follow God. I follow God because he's God. And the truth be known, I, I wouldn't want it to be this way, but if it was just me and my family alone that was living a Yeshua-centered life, there wasn't anybody else, we'd still be doing it. A team of wild horses, a team of wild horses couldn't tear me away from this lifestyle. There have been people, sadly, Men who've been with us for a little while and they go off and they, just like I'm talking about, they, you know, what I'm about to tell you is going to sound really sad and it is sad. But, you know, they, they get sidetracked because some, when they were buying chicken at the marketplace, some Jewish person gave them the cold shoulder and they, they lost it. They couldn't handle it anymore. Or they went to work and the boss man said that if you don't work on Shabbat, I'll fire you. And instead of just being strong and courageous and trusting God, 
they ripped that keeper right off their head because they need that paycheck. Or their family wouldn't invite them over anymore and mom and dad wouldn't talk to them because they don't want their son and daughter to be a Jew. And so they said, aye, sir, and ripped that Jewish right off and they're back there again. But that's happened. And what happens is those, some of those guys have had the feeling and, and people have messaged me and said, hey, so-and-so wants me to sell, wants to sell their tefillin to me. Is that okay? And I say, yeah, it is okay for them to do that. There's nothing wrong with the feeling. But how sad. You know, the the feeling is like the most precious thing a Jewish man has. Outside of his family, of course, but I'm talking about religiously. And there was a story about a rabbi who was walking and he was carrying his tefillin and he accidentally dropped one and he picked it up really quickly and he dusted it off and kissed it, said a baraka. And another rabbi was standing with his talmudim and he saw that. He said, do you see that rabbi? He said, that's how Hashem is with us. He carries us and we fall out of his hand. He picks us up, he dusts us off and he kisses us, restores us to a position of holiness. We're precious to him. So he, we're precious to him, and therefore he, we should be precious to us. When we wear tefillin, we have the name of God on us. And the rabbis say that when, when Hashem wears tefillin, think about that. When Hashem wears tefillin, he's got our name on the tefillin. I'm about to flip over the bima right now. I'm, it's everything in my power to restrain myself. But it's cyclical. God says, if you have my name on you, then I'll have your name on me. But it all goes back to following his will. So it says, be strong and courageous, and you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. And listen what he says. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go, wherever you go. God wants us to be successful. Then I found this passage in the book of Luke, turning to the book of Luke in chapter 24, I believe it is. <clears throat> and again, just going back to these days, I'm just revisiting the days when I left Egypt. That's what we're supposed to do, right? Revisiting the days, reminding ourselves why we do what we do. By the way, this is in, the, in the, one of the Haggadot that I have. There's a comment on there about why the, the wise sage needs to read the story of the Exodus, even though he probably knows it by heart. But why does he need to read it? And the answer is that sometimes we, we have intellectual understanding. And even today, even those of us who love God, and even when I'm talking to you right now, I'm talking about my love for God and my zeal for him, but we have this intellectual understanding. There comes that moment in time, though, where sometimes we lose sight of the why. We know what we're doing, and we know how we're doing it, but sometimes we forget why we're doing it. And I think, sadly, talking about uh, the, the unfortunate casualties that happen in religious life is because of that very reason. We get, we get caught up in the details of, of and, and details can be good, but they can also uh, detract from us when we don't understand why we're doing this. And so there's those moments in life when we've got to get quiet before Hashem and reread the story and come back to the why. Why am I living this life? Why am I a Jew centered on Yeshua? See, this is the point when I'm interacting with other Jewish people and they're, they're uh, negative. Maybe they have a negative attitude when they find out that I believe in Yeshua. And not, that's never comfortable. And I really dislike it. And I just wish we could all just, I'm just here to buy chicken. I mean, come on, really. I mean, I want a leg. I don't need, uh, you know, you asked me where I dove and I told you, now you're giving me a frowny face. I don't, I mean, who cares? Where do you dove in? I mean, I just feel like doing that sometimes. Whatever they say, I'm going to go, really? I don't know. I just want to get, you know, who cares, right? But, 
But here, see, some people, that freaks them out. You know, rejection, rejection. Maybe because when I was in high school, I got rejected all the time. But you know, rejection. I'm used to it. So you just, you have this rejection in your life. And, but here's what I know. The reason I, the why to why I do what I do is because of Yeshua HaMashiach. The why that got me here is because of him. If I jettison the why, then who am I? If I jettison the one who brought me to the dance, who, what is that? I would not even have known the word Torah if I didn't first know Yeshua. Doesn't matter, even if you say you're from a Jewish heritage and all those kind of things. Yeah, so what? Until you know Mashiach. We were all idolaters in Egypt. We just read that in the Haggadah last night. We were all idolaters in Egypt. You say, well, my father is Avraham. How do these stones he can raise children for Avraham? Did you ever hear the mixed multitude? I mean, really. What matters is that you understand the why. And because of that answer to the why, we have this verse, two verses, in the book of Luke, chapter 23, in fact. I said 24, but it's actually 23. Mashiach has just been crucified. His blood is everywhere. It's, you know, his body is being taken down. I can't imagine what the Talmudim must have thought. Hopes and dreams shattered. They thought this matzah was Mashiach bin David. They didn't realize it was the one being broken. They didn't realize that the matzah on the, on the crucifix was the poverty matzah. They didn't know that in three days' time, it was going to be the redemption matzah. And so it says here in verse 55, I got to give it to the women. I've got to give it to the women because oftentimes it's the women who pull us out of, as my wife would say, the mully grubs, right? You're not, not sure where the mully grubs are? They're very low. And sometimes my wife has to pull out her spatula and get me out of the mully grubs, right? It says in verse 55, the women who had come with Yeshua from Galilee followed Yosef and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Shabbat in obedience to the commandment. They rested on Shabbat in obedience to the commandment. Now, I want you to get that picture in your head because this was another turning point for me as Hashem was guiding me into the now what answer. Because these women did not lose sight of the why. The reason that Mashiach was having to fulfill this mission of dying, of going to that horrible situation the why behind that was because we did not follow God's law. The reason he was crucified on a tree is because we ate from a tree. The reason that he had to die is because Adam brought death into the world. Incidentally, Mashiach died at the ninth hour, and it says in the Midrash that Adam brought death at the ninth hour. And so the women looked and said, this is the why. We're not going to violate God's law, not even to bury my son. In Judaism, it's a big mitzvah to bury the dead. Yes. It's a big mitzvah to prepare the body for death. And thank God we have uh, Havra Kadisha that's developing here for that very reason. Thank God. Amazing. But we don't bury on the Shabbat. People ask me, Rabbi, I'm having a family member has passed away. They're having the funeral on Shabbat. Can I go? You know how hard it is to tell somebody no? Can't. Why? It's Shabbat. We didn't bury Messiah on Shabbat, so we don't bury anybody else on Shabbat. His mama looked at her son and said his body needs to be washed. 
Perfume needs to be put up on him. He needs to be wrapped. After Abdallah. Man. You tell me what the Mashiach was teaching his Talmudim. That she knew that truth so deep that she would let his body lay there in a bloody heap, a hot mess, and not touch him until she had lit the, the, the Abdallah candle. That's why it says early in the morning. Early in the morning. She was coming with all her stuff. And she met a gardener. And the reason he was the gardener is because he looked just like the first Adam, Rishon, who was tending the garden. And she says, sir, where are they taking his body? And he says, right here. That's the why. The why is because you're Mashiach. The reason we keep the Torah is because he's Messiah. I want to conclude with this famous story of Kepha. We're talking about pressing on. What do we do now? Pressing on to the goal. The why. Why do we do what we do? Why do we spend so much time working? So many volunteers working so hard to put on an event like last night. And there's other nights like Purim. And why? Why do we do that? Why? This is the why. And this is the now what? We're going to go home tonight, God willing, and have a second Seder and Havdalah and say blessings. And we're going to say Kiddu. We're going to say all these things. Why? Kepha. Kepha denied the Messiah. And Yeshua had told him when the cock crows three times, you will, have, will deny me. You will deny me three times. If we read Josephus, a simple reading of Josephus, we find out that there were no chickens or roosters in Jerusalem. They were not allowed by city health laws. In a walled city in ancient times, you could not have livestock like that. So there were not any cocks that crowed. And in fact, we read in Bava Kama 79b in the Talmud that the one who opened up the temple gate every morning was called the cock crow. That was his name. And the reason is, is because he would cry out in a loud voice, priests to your sacrifices, Levites to your platform, Israelites to your service. We started incorporating this with the Hazan when we begin our, our services every Shabbat now. And he would do that three times. He cried out in a loud voice. He said his voice was so loud you could hear it all the way in Jericho. Priests to your sacrifices, Levites to your platform, Israelites to your service. And he'd do it a third time. And each time, Kepha was denying Yeshua. He would deny him and it said he heard the cock crow. And he realized I denied his sacrifice, I denied his worship, and I denied his service. Wow. And what did Kepha do? Kepha went back to fishing. He went back to business. Kepha probably thought he was destined for Gehenna. Yeah. Kepha probably thought that there wasn't anything in life left for him. And I can imagine, I totally sympathize, I totally empathize with Kepha. I probably would have thought the exact same thing because Kepha was the one just go-getter, ready to, 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 to fall on the sword for Messiah and do whatever he needed to do for him. And so we have the story where Yeshua appeared in John chapter 21, it says, Afterward, Yeshua, uh, Yeshua appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and Kana, from Cana on in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. And they said, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter said. And we'll, they said, we'll go with you. These other disciples, they had not denied Yeshua like Kepha did, but they had done even worse. Kepha felt followed along 
And he was the only disciple to, to be close in the courtyard when he was being tried. And he denied the others just scattered from the moment they, the guys showed up with swords. So all together, you see all of them together decided we're all going to, we just might as well go back to fishing again. What else? What, what is there? But this is where tenacity picks up. And this is where Teshuvah kicks in. It says, early in the morning, Yeshua stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Yeshua. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Throw out your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because it had so many fish. Then the disciple who Yeshua loved said to Kepha, it is Mashiach. And as soon as Kepha heard him say, it is Mashiach, he wrapped himself in his outer garment around him and he leaped into the water. Fast forwarding a little bit, Kepha comes up to the shore and he basically asks Yeshua, now what? What's the new word for me? I believed in you and you told me to follow your Torah I denied you, and now I'm here and you're before me. So now what? What's my new word? And Yeshua tells him, your new word is the renewed word that you had before. Your new word is the word I told you before. Your new mission is the original mission. It's the restored mission. And just in case you need, this is, by the way, in Judaism... There is a, an idea that when you ask for repentance or ask for forgiveness from someone, that they should say you're absolved and that they should say it three times. You're absolved, you're absolved, you're absolved. This is why we say things so many times, three times in the sitter. And so Yeshua, excuse me, Kepha denied three times and Yeshua said, do you love me? Feed my sheep, you're absolved. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Feed my sheep. You're absolved. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Why do you keep asking me? I need you to feed my sheep. You're absolved. Now the word is, Kepha, be strong and be courageous and follow my Torah and lead people to me. This was the now what? This is what it means to be free. What it means to be free is to follow God and follow his law all the days of our life. Absolved, absolved, absolved. Hashem, thank you. What do we know? What do we know? Let your anointing fall upon us today and help us, Hashem, to live for you with our entire being and trust in you our entire lives. May we see Mashiach Yeshua speedily and soon, but more importantly, may we be faithful to your will. In Yeshua's name, amen.